questions. I won't be offended at all. So what I'm going to do here today is to go back far down to the basics. Um, we know about several refactoring techniques. We know about uh, extracting methods. We know about extracting fields. You probably have read uh, Martin Fowler's book. If not, you should definitely read it. Um, we know these kind of techniques. But what I want to get to is something even more fundamental than you know, even before applying some of those. Uh, why should we refactor? Uh, how do we approach refactoring? What are some of the techniques we could use to make refactoring a more productive uh, you know, task? Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on. And what I won't talk about here is a laundry list of refactoring techniques. You know, the reason is twofold. One, I can never remember those lists, uh, no matter how hard I try. The best way to really get good at those is to do them. And second, you can find them in most of the books. So why should I waste your time talking about what you can find in a book? So I'm going to share more about you know, what's worked for me and how things have evolved. What I would like for you to do is to ask questions, make comments, you know, something that may have worked for you. I want to know about you. I want to learn from you. Or ask questions about, hey, that kind of doesn't work. This is the problem I ran into. Absolutely. Anytime is a great time to you know, ask questions, make comments. Sounds good? All right, let's get started. Um, so what is refactoring? Refactoring is your genuine desire. I'm going to say genuine because why else would you do it, right? It's a code that works, and you're going to spend your time fixing the code that works. And the only reason you would do that is because you're genuinely interested in improving it. There's no other reason to do it. To improve the quality of your code and the design in it. Now, of course, you say, hey, we believe in developing working software. Actually, I would like to develop working relevant software. But then why do I care about quality of code? After all, the customer never sees the code, right? In fact, you hope the customer never sees the code. So why bother wasting time on code quality? That's a total waste of time, right? Well, I'll tell you why it's extremely important to care about quality of code. Because it's very simple, right? You cannot be agile if your code sucks. As simple as that. Your company says you're all agile, right? So you go to the customer. So here's my customer. I say, customer, don't worry, we are agile. The customer is all hyped up, excited. Really, what does that mean? You tell us what you want to change, and we will do that for you real quick. And the customer begins to tell you what he wants. As the customer is telling you that, in the back of your mind, you realize, oh my god, that means I got to touch that code. The one that you touched last time and could not go home that weekend. Now you're going to convince the customer that's not a good idea, right? <laughs> so you cannot possibly be agile if your code sucks. So if you really want to be responding to change quickly, the only way that's going to happen is if the code is of good quality. Otherwise, we might as well forget about it. I'm not saying that's the only thing that's needed, but that's one of the essential things. And without it, it's almost impossible to achieve that. You say, wait a minute, but it takes time. Developing high quality code takes a lot of time. Well, I'll tell you, it takes incredibly a lot of time. But it's more complex than that. Who here can write wonderful code? Raise your hand if you can. Two people. You're all lying. <laughs> I'll tell you, I write code that sucks. You don't want to look at the code I write. You're going to say, really? This is your code? But you know what I'm really good at? I'm extremely good at finding fault with your code. <laughs> so I found out this dichotomy, right, that I really suck at writing code. But on the other hand, I'm so good at finding fault with other people's code. So I realized, why should I waste time writing great code when I can write some crappy code real quick? I can give it to him. And while he tells me how my code sucks, I can look at his code and say how his code sucks. In the end of the day, we all have good code. So don't pretend that you can write good code because nobody can write good code. But we all collectively can, and that is why we also need refactoring. So it takes time to do it. But why should we really care about it? Because lowering quality lengthens the development time. If you really, really say, you know what, my project is going too fast. What do I do? Write shabby code. That'll take care of your progress, right? 
So one of the best ways to mess up a project is to really write poor quality code. That's one of the first laws of programming we need to be careful with. So why should we refactor? Well, the first reason is to make the code easier to understand. Because we cannot obviously maintain code that we cannot understand. So that's very important to do that. It's easier to maintain. In fact, we want to do more maintenance. You know, we think that maintenance is a bad word, but it really is not. Uh, Robert Glass has a book on fallacies of software development, and one of the things he says in it is that a good software goes through more maintenance. If you're a mechanic shop, you want to do more car maintenance every day because that's what your profit is. If you're developing software, you want to make more releases with more features more quickly, and that is what maintenance is. Because we are so bad at doing it, we kind of give a negative connotation to it, but we want to be able to do more maintenance and to be able to make effect of the changes we want to make, and that's very important. But why should we care about all of this? And the reason is the only constant is change, right? We always have to be prepared for change, and, and that's basically what Heraclitus said, is the only constant is change. So we want to be able to embrace this change. Now, of course, there's a more important reason, because as, as this beautiful saying here says, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. We read code more than we write. But you ask yourselves, why is it that we, most of us write bad code? And the reason most of us write bad code is most of us have read bad code. I mean, this is sad. Most of us even don't know how a good code looks. Because we've seen them so much, we don't even realize it. And so if you find a good code, make a big deal about it. Immediately tell the word, oh, look how beautiful, thanks. Uh, well, look how beautiful this code is and why it is good so we can all kind of you know, relate to that and pick it up more. That's very important. So one of the reasons to do this is because you cannot write perfect code in one sitting. It is impossible. If you think you can write code in one sitting correctly, that just means that you're in an illusion. Nobody can. And it takes an iterative approach. You write something, and then you evolve it and refactor it. And to me, I really started appreciating writing code more after I wrote a book. Because when I wrote code, nobody ever saw it. In fact, you kind of take pride. It's my code, right? When you write books, you cannot do that, assuming you want to you know, really sell the book. And the editor reads the book, and he pokes your eyes and says, do you know how to write English? And then he corrects you. And then you give it to tech review. The guys who do tech review don't pat you in the back and say, great job. They say, do you know how you suck? And then they tell you how you should improve it. And by the time, I, I, I have copies of my first version of the books. And I look at what comes out. And it's like, wow. It's, it's, did I do that? Right? And it goes through so many revisions. And when I did that, I realized, my god, if only people read my code the way they read my book meaning as it is being evolved, how good the quality of my code would be. And that's one of the things I started doing is to make sure the code gets reviewed and, and gets better, and it's a way for us to learn because we cannot create a perfect code in the beginning. It's impossible. And designed rather than happening just once right at the first, it has to evolve continuously during the development process. Nobody can design it once and say, I'm done. And if somebody tells you, I designed this product, it was so cool, and we never changed the design, what they're telling you is their project got canceled, <laughs> right? Because any product that is useful has to evolve, and as a result, its design has to evolve as well. So you have to accommodate the design. That's very, very critical. And without it, it's impossible to achieve it. And code that's hard to understand is worse than the code that is lost. You know, if the code is lost, you can tell your boss, we don't know where the code is, seriously. We looked for it hard and fast. We couldn't find it. All that we have is this binary. And what does the boss say? OK, fine, go write it. And you can rewrite it. But if the code is in front of you, they won't let you rewrite it. And you soldier your way, and you're scratching your head. I work for a company. We did simulators, right? These were million-dollar simulators we were selling. And when we looked at the simulator, one of the most important things in the simulator, at the very core of it, is a timing engine. Because this is the heartbeat, a pulse of this. 
And the guys who wrote the code were no longer with the company. And it came down to, we have to maintain it. So I took one myself and said, I'm going to understand this code. I started reading it. And about three weeks later, I was like, yep, I understood it. Well, OK, what do we do now that, now that you understand it? I said, I'll write a document about it. So I described how it works. And about six months went by. A programmer who's much better than me came on, on board. He knows the domain very well, knows everything more. He read my description, read the code, and he said, you are totally wrong. That's not the way the code works. I said, wow. So how does it work? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> we kind of gave up. And this is when I love managers, because managers have the best metaphors. And my boss said, we'll pour concrete over it. I'm like, wow, that's so awesome. Right? And so we started pouring concrete over code, meaning don't touch it. Right? And you fear this code like this dark room in the grandma's house, right? They tell you, whatever you do, don't go into that room. Because anybody who went there never came back. <laughs> and now you don't want to touch this code. It's like, oh, don't touch that code, right? That's not the way software should be maintained, right? So that is more important to be able to maintain it. So we have to be able to evolve it. So one of the mantras that I follow is, make it work, make it better. Don't pretend that you can write good code in the beginning. Make it work. First, make sure this is exactly what you want it to be. Then make it evolve. And when I say make it better, not make it better in seven months. Make, make it better in two weeks. Write away before the end of the day. A small piece of code that works. Think about this for a minute. Frederick Brooks said, go ahead and build a software. And when you're done with it, throw it away. And then try again, and you have a chance of getting it. Now, try telling that to your boss at work on Monday. Boss, I went to the session, and they reminded me of Frederick Brooks. We got to create this software, and when you're done, we'll throw it away. That's the easiest way to get fired from work, right? And the boss says, no, 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 no. We got to release the software, right? But does it mean that Frederick Brooks is wrong? Not at all. The man is actually sage-wise. He is correct. But how could we follow his advice of throwing software? Well, I realized the man is right, but I just misinterpreted what he said. Imagine you don't wait until the end of the software to throw it, but you throw everything you do every few minutes. Look at how easy and trivial it is now. You write a little code and say, well, that sucks. And you immediately refactor it, throw it away, start over. And so you take these small steps and don't tell your boss you threw away code you wrote in the past five minutes. You can still keep your job, write fantastic code, and build a software, and learn from it. And this is exactly where agile development fits in, because rather than trying to build this massive product and then realize we did it wrong, why don't we do a thin slice of it? Learn from that experience, get the feedback, throw it away, evolve it. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So what he said makes a lot of sense when we approach it in smaller qualities, quantities like that. So refactoring reduces the risk in developing software. It can provide us a fairly lightweight, pragmatic design. Unfortunately, this is not guaranteed. It takes a certain amount of effort on our part to be able to achieve this. That's very important. So what is refactoring after all? It's an art of improving the design of existing code. Beautiful word. Look at that. It's an art. It is not engineering. It is where you sit there and say, in fact, I'll tell you, this is what really caught my attention. I became a programmer because of the science in programming. I remained a programmer because of the art in programming. That is where the fun really is. If it was purely science, I'd have moved on to, God forbid, a manager some other place, right? But I'm still a programmer today because of the art in programming. That is where you write the code, and you can see it evolve. And you can just look at abstract and say, hey, this is how it's going to evolve. And you can just sit there and tweak it. It's so much fun to see that happen. And so it's a process of changing a software system in such a way that it does not alter the external behavior of the code, yet improves the internal structure. Now think about this for a minute. It doesn't do anything different, yet you are changing it. This is what gets you in trouble with the boss. The boss says, wait a minute, when you're done with it, it's not going to do anything more for me. Why should I pay you to do it? So you have, I don't like this. The other day I was watching one guy who was complaining endlessly. Until he paged up and found that he actually wrote it doesn't remember anymore. <laughs> he doesn't complain anymore. It's like, OK, that doesn't look that bad anymore, right? 
So we all have this tendency to dislike other people's code, or code that we think is not ours. So just because you think it's got to be refactored doesn't mean it's got to be refactored. Consider the cost of change and the impact of change. How much is it going to cost to change it? What's the cost of changing this? Get a second opinion. Just because you think this is a great change to make, you can come over here and join us. It's OK. Yeah. Um, he's probably gone through some code himself. OK. So get a second opinion, right? Um, hey, I'm you know, thinking of this particular change. What do you think? Uh, the person may say, well, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Or the person may say, have you considered this other situation? And you end up really realizing there's something else that needs to be done, right? There's no fun just doing it in the dark. So get a second opinion of somebody whom you respect on the project. Don't soldier through it alone on your project. But refactoring can be hard. Oh, yes, it can be very hard. But a lot of other things are hard in life. Socialization is hard, right? Socializing with people is hard. Hey, standing up and talking is hard. And depending on the speaker, sitting and listening is even harder. Right? So a lot of stuff are hard in life. So it depends on how you approach it. That's why he had this earplug on and was singing, right? There are ways to cope up with these problems, right? Absolutely. So how do we deal with this? So one of the things is the only thing to fear is fear itself, as, as uh, FDR said. So yes, it's natural for us to fear. When you tell me to go do something that I've not done before, or I'm so worried that I may embarrass myself doing it, a natural tendency is for us to get you know, fearful. But the only way to deal with fear is to really logic. You know what? That is one of the things we in this room are really good at. We are extremely logical, right? That's why some of the spouses we have don't really appreciate us, right? Every time they say, how about emotion? Honey, let's talk, look at this logically. And they don't want to sit with you anymore, right? So it's natural, understandable. But let's use it to the advantage in these cases. We can be very logical. So think about it. How can we do it? So why do we fear things? I thought about three reasons that I can fear about. What if I break something that worked? That's a good fear to have. Is my change worse than the original code? Sometimes I have the feeling, did I improve this really? <laughs> right? And we hate being embarrassed. It's easy to leave things you know, unchanged. You know what? It worked. Why do I mess with it? Why do I take a you know, problem with it? So help me here. I want your thoughts. Uh, what if I, br if I break something that worked? How do we deal with that? Writing unit, Writing unit test. I'm going to just change that a little bit. The reason is sometimes, well, a lot of times, the legacy code is so messed up, there is no possibly a human can write a unit test. But that is not a reason to give up. We've got to be very, you know, uh, we've got to really explore it. So my recommendation is deal with it by writing automated tests. And why should I write automated tests? Because before you change the code, write a test, try to get a coverage, and in fact, what I would do is, once the coverage says the area of the code I want to refactor has been touched, I literally break this code. And I make sure my test is failing. That gives me confidence that I'm actually reaching into that code. Then I put back the code I had, make sure the test is passing. Now I refactor and make sure the test is still passing. Here's another thing to, be, you know, to have credit for. A lot of companies don't have unit tests on legacy code, but they have a fairly decent amount of you know, integration tests. Sometimes the custom companies may not have, but key customers have written a few things. Go find wherever you can and run those tests. And when you refactor, you know that the code does still what it did before. Why should we do that? And the reason simply is you don't want to fix the code and find out that two things or three things that worked before doesn't work anymore. Because by refactoring, if you break the code, then at lunchroom, they, you will be the person of laughing stock. They'll say, oh, he's going to refactor code again, right? So that's not what you want to you know, create as. So make sure the refactoring actually works. Is my change worse than the original code? How do you counter that? Please. So just a thought like this. Yes, please. Right. So now I go and I refactor it. It's still on the crappy test itself. Right. So essentially, I have the same design as in the fact. But you know what's good about it? 
If they didn't know it was crappy before, they won't know it crappy after you change it. <laughs> right? So we're good still. At least it gives you a little bit of confidence to get going with that, right? So that's the best part about it. So if change is worse than the original code, what do you do? how do you deal with that? Say that again? Exactly. How about asking for a review with somebody, pair with somebody? Right? You, you do something, you say, what do you think? Is this better? Is this worse? So you can always get a f ask feedback from respectable colleagues and mentors. Respectability is important there, right? <laughs> <laughs> we hate being embarrassed. It's easy to leave things as it is. How do we deal with that? I got a very simple answer for it. We are programmers. We are shameless. Get over it, <laughs> right? If you were so sensitive, the first compilation error would have turned you away from programming, right? <laughs> we take this nonsense every day. The compiler continues to spit at you. What do you do? You wipe your face and continue coding, right? So we can deal with it. Come on. All right. So I'm going to talk about some simple principles to deal with. So let's consider some principles that can help us refactoring. I'm going to give you about 11 principles, I think, depending on how we count it. So let's get started. The zeroth principle. We got to start with zero, right? We don't do stuff with one in our field because that would be too easy to deal with things. So the zeroth principle. This always drives me nuts. I go to a place and they say, you go to the first floor. I go to the first floor, then they tell me there's a ground floor somewhere. I can never get this right. OK. So rely on automated tests. That's what you said a few minutes ago, right? So you want to have automated tests, some kind of automated tests uh, as much as you can. Uh, to go back to your point earlier, uh, there are certain tools that can go through a code and try to figure out various combinations of input and output. So you could use tools to generate some test cases as well. It doesn't say the code is correct by any means, but it simply says whatever it did before, it continues to do now. That's all we can do, right? And then we can evolve it from there. This is most ideal if you can have unit tests. But like I mentioned, there are times when it's really hard to write unit tests, but some kind of an automated test functional integration is good. Yes, please. How about something like Because you functionality? That's an excellent question. My first thing is, I, uh, this is not about you, right? I hate when people say performance is important. And I tell them, how important it is? Oh, very important. Well, if it's so important, where's your test about it? So if anybody cares about performance of a system, but don't have a test related to it, they're just kidding. So if performance is very important, first write a test for performance. And say, my code, this particular activity, should respond within this duration of time. Write a test for it. That becomes your test as well. And if the test, the test doesn't exist, then of course, you know, you need to ask what the performance is. But a lot of times what I find, I'm, I'm kind of deviating from here, but when I deal with customers, when they say performance is very important, I tell them, write a test case for it. And they're reluctant. And then eventually I say, tell me what the hard number is. And they eventually realize performance really was not that important as they proposed it to be. So wherever it is really important, back it with the test. Otherwise, there's no way to really measure that and keep up with it as we evolve the system. Right. And when you are doing unit tests, it is more at the code level. Oh, no. You, you, if you make the code level, it might still work functionally. But it might impact the overall system performance, and that will be very late. Right, but uh, it, it is not a very late because you would run these tests very you know, quickly, and performance tests have to be run continuously as well. If we don't run performance tests continuously, then we just don't care about it, and we just pretend that we do. So, so isolate the code if you can, and if you will, and create these tests. So what do you look for? Surprisingly, to write good quality code, the advice comes from not a computer science book. It actually comes from a book which talks about how to write good English. This book was written a good 30 years ago. I cannot recommend this book enough. If you haven't read this book, buy it. And I say it with confidence because I didn't write it. So this is called On Writing Well. It's a fantastic book by William Zunzer. And in the book, he talks about four principles to write good English, nonfiction. And it turns out, I think these four things are the fundamentals of refactoring. And when I refactor my code, when I write my code, this is what I think about. The four principles he talks about, 
The first one he talks about is simplicity. He says things have to be simple. Now, by the way, creating simple things is extremely hard. Einstein said any intelligent fool can create something complex and violent, but it takes a touch of genius to create simple things. Simple things are the hardest to find. But there's another impediment, by the way. Who here wants to create something very simple? Because simple is boring. Simple makes us insecure. Suppose he's my boss or a, or a you know, supervisor. I show him a design. And he looks at this and says, yeah, that looks simple. You feel let down. You say, really? You just looked at it. You understood it? You say, give it to me. I'll, be, come, I'll come back tomorrow. And the next day, you show him the design. And he is developing ulcer as he's seeing it. And you're like, yeah. I took two hours to write it. You better take seven days to understand it. Barely, though, right? So we feel good about creating complexity, but it really takes beyond that to create code that actually is simple. That's hard. The next thing is clarity. You want to create code that is very, very clear. But you know what? I will tell you about everyone in this room, right? We all want to code, write code, and we are proud of this. You show it to the other guy, and he's scratching his head until the hair falls off. Why do you use shift operator seven times there? And then he's like, what do you think? Imagine if you leave puzzles behind to your team. They're not going to develop software. They're going to come to work. They might as well go solve Sudoku, right? They're there to get some real work done. So make it very clear. When there is a deadline looming over the head, they want to fix the code. They open the code, and they're like, what's this puzzle he has left behind? Don't torture people, right? They curse you. Right, the words they use, don't, you don't want to take that. So just write code they can understand. And they thank you. You will not hear it, but it adds you a karma bank. OK, so just do that. Brevity. Brevity is tricky, right? Brevity doesn't mean just short. I had one guy, uh, you know, I was, um, you want to keep things short. In, in English, he says, don't write long sentences. We Indians are so good at it. We write long sentence. By the time you get to the half of the sentence, you have no clue what you're talking about. Right? One of the first things my professor said is, don't write long sentences. Like, what's your problem? And then I looked at the papers, like, oh yeah, he's right. Right? So write short sentences. In coding, similarly, right? <coughs> shorter methods, shorter you know, classes, shorter programs. Anything that you can. But don't take it too much too much. I was teaching a course in Northern Virginia, and one guy said, How dare you come to this company? We are a great software company, and you tell us we cannot use single letter variables. I was like, man, I offended this guy. Uh, I'm sorry, you know what? That's a good practice, you know, if you can take it or leave it. And he said, Well, oh, no, 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 I was just pulling your leg. Uh, you should look at our code. Man, it's single letter variables everywhere. And six months later I went back to this company, the same guy said, Oh Venkat, I want to thank you. I was like, really? For what? You came last time and told us not to use single letter variables. It has made a huge difference. I was so proud. I said, really? He said, we use two letters now. <laughs> there is no way to fix this, right? So you want to write code that is easy to understand. So brevity doesn't mean cryptic. Bre brevity is different from terseness, right? So keep things small. That's very important. And the last one is probably the most difficult one. Because I was reading through this and said, humanity, we are a bunch of emotionless people, logical people. Why would humanity be involved in it? And I can vouch for this every time. You call a couple of guys and say, how do you design this code? And they talk about, oh, you would do this, you do that. It's a lifeless computer they're talking about, and the design no wonder sucks. Instead, you throw that away and say, hey, if you were doing this, how would you do it? Bam, comes out a beautiful design. Because they put themselves into it, right? So humanity is extremely important to create a good quality software. So I think these are extremely good principles to follow. So the first principle, the zeroth principle is over. Reduce code. Oh my god, I cannot emphasize this. I'll guarantee you, the code you did not write has the fewest bugs. Right? You cannot have bugs in the code you didn't write. There is no way you can improve from there, right? So the code you didn't write, but what do programmers do? Before you can turn your head, 30 lines of code. Wow, how did you do that? The other day, somebody showed me like three pages of code, right? Do you need all of that? Well, we are so you know, eager to write a lot of code. In fact, 
A great programmer avoids writing code. You need to really say, do I really need to do that? I'm going to question that. So don't write code that is really not needed. That takes a courage to say, you know what, I'm not going to write that. I don't need that right now. So programmers end up writing as much code as restaurants serve food. This is one of the biggest problems, by the way. You go to the restaurant, they give you food like you're, not going, to, like you're going to go into a de, you know, dessert for the next one week. Eat a beta, right? Why? Why should I have so much food, right? And same thing with coders. Why should I write all that code? I, I'll share with you an experience. This was a delightful. I came back from my international trip. I was starved. I was hungry. I went into this restaurant, sat down, and I was alone, you know, sit down, give the menu. And I said to this guy, I want this, 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 and this. In a very straight face, this guy looks at me and says, who else is with you? I said, I'm alone. And he said, that's all for you. I said, yeah, that's all for me. And then he kind of smirks and says, uh, you won't handle it. I was angry for a second, right? I said, excuse me? And he said, I bet you, you cannot eat that much food. How do you know about my appetite? And this guy says, OK, I'll hit a deal with you. I will give you half the food you ask for. You decide to pick which half you want. And if you finish it, and if you want more food, the rest of the food I serve you is on me. I was like, OK, fine. Let's take it as a challenge. So he gives me half the food. I ate half of that. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. Because can I bring you more? It's like, please, no. But you know what he did that day? He earned my business. He earned my respect. He could have wasted the food and earned the money, but he had the wisdom to say, you don't have a clue what you're doing. I'm not going to serve. I was not like asking for alcohol or something like that, right? This is plain food, that's all. And I want programmers to have that kind of courage to say, I don't need to be writing this code, right? So take that courage. Code you don't write, of course, is easier to maintain. You don't have to maintain. This is one of the beautiful code that I always like to remember. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to remove. So a great way to improve code is to remove it. What did Michelangelo do? He took a marble slab. And what did he add to it to create this beautiful naked David? Nothing, absolutely. All that he did his time was to tactfully remove. And that is one of the most important things to remember. A lot of times we are so eager to add stuff when we really should be focusing on what can we remove. Don't write clever code. Now, uh, if you ask me, in my experience, what has gotten me the most trouble into, it has been clever code. I remember in, in one of my books, as I was writing it, I did something very clever. I was so proud of it. I said, isn't this beautiful? About uh, two weeks goes by, and in production, the book is in production, somebody downloads the code and has a problem. And eventually, the publisher comes back to me and says, what's up with this? And I look, it's like, oh, dear. I remember how clever I was that day. And that was just not one time, by the way. Every time I write clever code, I've got into trouble. But the good news is I've learned from my experience. Now when I write the code, the minute my brain says this is clever, I delete it. I don't want this to go out anywhere, right? Because clever code causes problem. So don't write anything clever. Write something simple. And make it clear, but not clever. That's very important. Make it small and cohesive. When you're writing code, ask yourself, is my code doing one thing and one thing well? If your code is doing, so if I ask you, what does my code, what does the code do? And if you say, my code does this and, time out. That word and gave you away. It should be one thing that, don't put comma, right? So there's one thing it should do. And that is what cohesion is, that it is focused, narrow, and does one thing well. So why should we not write long methods? How many of you believe writing long methods is a good idea? Nobody. OK, usually one person raises the hand. Oh, she, no, she was scratching her head. OK, <laughs> fine. And I would ask this person, why do you think writing long methods is good? And this guy, genuinely, good reason. He would say, because the code runs faster. And you know what? He is right. But that's when Nixon was the president. A lot of things have changed since then in computer architecture, right? 
This person didn't look at a book since then, right? Still, so who's the president? I should have asked him, Nixon. No, 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 no. <laughs> Things have changed, right? Watergate, dude, right? So the point really is, that is no longer true. There is compiler technology, optimization technology. How many of you have seen long methods at work? Look at that. This is called cognitive dissonance. <laughs> Everyone here knows writing long methods is bad, bad, bad. And yet we see long methods at work. And you know why? Because I know nobody in this room has written long methods. The guys writing long methods are making the methods longer at work today. Not coming here, right? What a sad story. They're sitting there behind your back, making your methods longer. This is atrocious, right? But we all know writing long methods is a bad idea. But why is writing a long method a bad idea? Anybody? What is that? Ah, wonderful. Hard to reuse. Don't say reuse. People think it's good, right? Hard to reuse. OK, what else? Hard to debug. It never conforms to single responsibility, right? So yeah. Uh, so no single response SRP, single responsibility principle. Okay, what else? Usually very complex. Complex. Okay, complex. What else? What was that? Not easy to test. Hard to test. Hard to read. This guy has hopes. Okay. All right. What else? What was a bug prone? Okay. What else? Uh, what was that? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Where does it start? <laughs> And end. <laughs> yeah, hard to see the whole thing. What else? Side effects. Side effects. Beautiful. What else? Leads to duplication, isn't it? You got this long method. Somebody said reuse, right? Right there in the middle is the code you want, but it's right embedded down there. What do you do? Oh, well, wait a minute. You copy that and stick it into another long method. So it leads to code duplication, right? It's hard to maintain. This list, by the way, goes on and on and on. And yet, people write long methods. Scary, isn't it? We all know this is a terrible thing to do, and yet we see it. You say, well, OK, wait, wait, we got to fix this. What do we do? You say, I've told all the things to my colleague. He doesn't listen. I got one last, one last effort. What was that? Never works. Yeah. But just because it works, unfortunately, is not good enough, right? Will it continue to work? That's where the problem is, right? Because unfortunately, software has to evolve. My, my, my RAM is so small, I don't retain what I say. He expects me to remember stuff I say. OK, all right. So what was I saying? OK, so anyway, so if you're maintaining, so you, you have this last ditch effort, right? So you go to work on one Monday. Sit down at work, don't talk, just continue to code. And your colleague comes to you and says, how was, how was the weekend? You could tell your colleague, oh, the weekend was great. On Saturday, I went to the movies, and Sunday, I went to the park. And your colleague may say, really, which movie did you go to? You can tell the movie name. And then you can talk about a scene in the movie, right? But don't do that. Your colleague says, how was your weekend? Oh, the weekend. Well, at 7 o'clock, I got into the car, turned the ignition on, put it in reverse, took it about five feet away, turned to the right, turned to the left, drove around, stood at this light, there was a bird over there I was watching, and then I turned left. Just keep talking like this for a while. And your colleague is in a panic mode, and then says, have you gone crazy? You say, no, I thought I'll tell you how my weekend was like you write code, right? Because that's the way you, your colleague writes code, right? Brrr. Where does it start? Where does it end? And what did you do in the process? Nothing is known. You just pl plow through. That's not the way you communicate with people. You say, on Saturday, I had this, Sunday, I had this. Then you dig into the detail where you're interested in. That is exactly how we should be writing code. So long methods have no place. And how long should a method be? Somebody says 20 lines of code. Another guy says 10. And the Ruby guys are like, 10 is too long. <laughs> right? Seven lines, three lines. Well, it doesn't matter how many lines. One thing I would say is, you must be able to see the entire code in one window without scrolling. Uh, don't, don't lower the font size, right? <laughs> but it's more than the size of the code, by the way. You want to make sure 
that the code is in one level of abstraction. That is the most important thing. When you get into a code, there is one level of abstraction. Like, for example, if somebody tells you, how was your weekend, you talk about major things you did in the weekend. Went to a movie, went to the park. You're not drilling into any of these details more in, in a very short sentence. And if you want to talk about which movie it is, that is a second level of abstraction, like which corner street the park was at. And if you want to talk about one specific scene in the movie, that's like one particular tree in the park. So those are multiple levels of abstraction, and writing code exactly involves that. We need to focus on that. So that is something important to keep in mind, and we can avoid having long methods if we do that. The fourth principle is eliminate duplication, because code duplication is hard, evil to maintain. And it, I, was, I was speaking to a company in Hyderabad, I was talking about how bad the duplicated code is. This, guy, this programmer was in complete sync with me. He said, you know, Venkat, you're absolutely right. In our application, we fix the same bug every two months. I said, oh my god, does somebody actually run over and put the bug in back in the, in the code? He said, oh, no, 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 no. This code is duplicated so many places, we keep discovering it. I said, oh my god, how does it feel? He said, oh, that sucks. And I said, of course, when you find the bug and you find it's duplicated, you do remove the duplication, refactor the code, right? He says, what a great idea. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> right? There's no end to it. If you don't remove duplication, that's an opportunity for refactoring. So every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative source of representation in the system. And that's what the dry principle is all about. Eliminate dependency. Let me emphasize this. I am not asking you to invert the dependency. I'm tired of that. People want you to do inversion of invert dependency. What does that mean? Brrr, comes an inversion framework. Please, thank God, we don't need to do that. Don't invert dependency. Get rid of it. I was in speaker comps, uh, con a couple of years ago, and I race arranged one in Philadelphia. I was quietly listening to a group of guys having a good chat. And they were all saying, oh, we would be doing more unit testing if only they were more easy to maintain. And a few minutes later, I kind of pitched in and I said, hey, maybe, guys, your unit testing is really hard, maybe because your design sucks. Just saying that I offended everybody in the room. They were like angry. What do you know about our design? How could you say that? I said, because I design, my design sucks all the time. I thought you guys are like me. And then they said, but well, how would you design this? We talked about this for a few minutes, and I blogged about it after that weekend. And my recommendation is, knock out dependencies before you mock out dependency. So we, most of the time, so eager to mock dependency, we fail to realize we don't need to be mocking if we can knock it out. So the first design refactoring technique I would use is to eliminate dependency, not invert it. Because the eliminated dependency goes away, doesn't bother you anymore. There's no marking. At the end of the discussion, half the people were still mad at me, and the other half said, interesting, I should go back and try this, because I think there's opportunities for me to actually knock these dependencies out by you know, redesigning the application. So that is one of the things. If you want interest, just Google for knock out before you mark out, and you can look at the blog entry and, and read more about it. The sixth principle is make comments redundant and remove. I cannot tell you how much I hate comments. Comments are devil's work. I, I'll tell you why comments are such a bad idea. You, I'm sure you've seen your share of comments, right? The other day I was looking at a piece of code. And, and this guy, of course, very genuinely interested in commenting code. A class, my class, whatever that class was, right? And then, of course, comes the wisdom. Public, my class constructor, <laughs> right? Very useful. I was looking at this like, dude, if you don't know it's a constructor, you have no business being there, right? <laughs> if that is not enough, then flows even more wise things. I plus plus increment, <laughs> right? I'm so thankful because looking at it, I was not cheer. You know, once you go beyond a certain age, you're like, is that a plus plus or a star star, right? So, very useful. Thanks for clarifying, right? Why do people do that? I'll tell you why. They're not, they're doing it not because they want to. 
It's because they have corporate police. And the corporate police says, you will document the code. And the genuine good programmer says, what if I don't? No bonus for you. <laughs> oh, commenting, right? <laughs> because, I mean, we want bonus too. We'll follow. What's the big deal? I'll do it. So the corporate police does that for us, right? So don't write comments like that. So when should the comment really be there? Yep, please. Uh, PHP docs or Java docs, is there the kind of comments you would still not advise? Well, uh, the docs are good for external users, but don't get me started on that. The other day, I was looking at a Java doc. The method name says pass through. This was middle of the night. Honest to God, I didn't know what pass through was. <laughs> I went to Java doc, and it said, this method allows you to pass through. What do you do? <laughs> so let's not even go there, right? Sorry. OK, so write executable documentation. So you know, here's the feeling. Of, I really get angry about comments. Good code should be self-documented. Commenting a good code is like explaining a good joke. <laughs> One rule of thumb, you should never do this, right? You tell a joke, and, and Ravi says, well, what's funny about that? The best thing to do is you say, never mind, and you move on. Here's what you don't do. Let me explain to you, Ravi. <laughs> and you explain the joke, and he's like, and what's funny about that? <laughs> So you say a joke, and people don't get it. What do you do? You say, never mind. And you go home quietly that night, and you refactor your joke. <laughs> and you say, why did this not appear funny to these guys? Then you go to a fresh set of audience and try it the next day. If they get it, you did well. If they didn't get it, don't try stand-up comedy. That's not going to work for you, right? The point is, a good code is like that. And of course, there is places where you want to express what it means. So a good test is worth a 1,000 comments. The seventh principle, make sense in seconds, not minutes, hours, days, weeks. I want to throw a couple of things at you. Look at this code real quick. I want you to measure the amount of time it takes you to understand this. Raise your hand when you know how this code works. Here you go. Most of you are still reading. That's already timed out. OK, so sl slowly is raising the hand. And that too reluctantly, right? <laughs> How many of you, what about this one here, by the way? Quick. We can understand fairly well, right? Because this is, did you notice one thing? This code is at several levels of abstraction. Did you notice that? We are going multiple levels of details, whereas this says I'm going to be at one level of detail. So which of these two is a better version? The second one, unless you're a consultant writing code by the number of lines of code you write, right? So let's burn that code. We have to write good code, right? So make it easy to understand very quickly. Avoid primitive obsession. We are at this point where we write, to like code, write code at the lowest level. And we have to really work hard to remove that. Here's an example. Is e spelling correct? That itself is spelled incorrectly. <laughs> file equals new file. And then it says, for each line, go through. This is, by the way, Groovy code. I was looking at this code. This was actually code written by somebody. As I was looking at this code, it took me a couple of minutes to understand. And once I understood this code, I was like, really? And I rewrote it. And that was exactly the same thing. And I'm relying on a higher level API, avoiding the primitive obsession. Sometimes you just want to be at the very low level. This is one of the most important things for me. Check in code frequently. How frequently? Within minutes. Not days, not weeks, not months. Within minutes. Now, I'll share with you just a story real quick before I go with this. I was pairing up with the programmer. I was the mentor in the team. This is the reason I love mentoring, because very quickly I become the student. I begin to learn. I was pairing up with this guy, and we were supposed to refactor a class that was the you know, facade to the database. And I'm thinking about this. My god, this refactoring is going to take about maybe four or five hours. And it was about two in the afternoon. And this guy sitting next to me, we were in you know, Holland. I was on a project there. And the guy sitting next to me says, all right, let's start refactoring. 
We did a little bit work. Immediately he runs the unit test, all that unit test passes. And then he kind of looks at me and says, now I should check this code into the version control, right? And I smiled at him and said, you said the right thing. Here's a candy for you. <laughs> but tell me why you should check in the code right now. He said, I have three reasons. I was like, wow, this dude has thought through this. Three reasons tell me what those are. He said, the first reason, if we continue to work with this for several hours, it'll become a merge hell. Number one rule of programming, you should never receive merge hell. You only give it. <laughs> And he's like, yep, I said, great. The second problem, we are trying to refactor this, and when we are done, we realize this is not compatible with the rest of the system, but if we keep checking this in, you know, often, if it doesn't go well with everybody else, they kick and scream, and immediately we can revert and go forward. I said, excellent. What's your third reason? He looked at the watch and said, I have to leave in 50 minutes. <laughs> and he said, when I come back in the morning, Chances are I have other things to work on. You could pair up with somebody else and continue to work on this because I know you have no life, but I have to go. And then he said, when we come back in the morning, we could pick it up again or somebody else could pick it up. And to me, that is extremely important. You should be able to leave your work in the system where somebody else can pick it up and run with it. If you have jeopardized the entire system, some companies you've probably heard, this guy sends an email or announcement. Nobody compiled the code for the next hour. Why? Because I'm refactoring. No, that's not refactoring. That's messing it up. So you should be able to continue to evolve the system along the way. So let me quickly wrap up. So frequent check-in is extremely important. I cannot emphasize it enough. The last principle, keep code at one level of abstraction. This is called the compose method pattern. So when do you refactor? Generate a general awareness. Keep looking for code. By the way, what a beautiful metaphor, smelly code. Awesome metaphor, isn't it? Ken Beck is awesome. You know why this is a wonderful, wonderful meta metaphor? You come and sit next to somebody, and you kind of twinch your nose. What's that smell? And guess what happens about five minutes later? You don't feel it anymore. <laughs> right? That is why code smell is so evil. You join the project and the code sucks, you program for three weeks, you don't feel it anymore. And you write code like that. Next day you come with much more smelly shirt, right? I won't feel the smell anymore, right? And that's why this is a fantastic metaphor. Somebody from the outside comes and senses this, and this guy better leave quickly, otherwise gets too used to it. So look for this and, and refactor continuously. So code is messed up beyond any reasonable repair, don't refactor, it's too late. And if you're in the middle of fixing a bug, then don't refactor. Fix the bug, then come back to refactoring. If you don't see a clear benefit to a particular refactoring, don't do it. So when do you refactor? Before fixing bug or after fixing a bug? Before enhancement or after enhancement? Never in the middle. And if you think you can improve the quality of code, and if you want to make it easier to understand the code, refactor it. So how do you refactor? Take very, very, very small steps. Extremely small steps are very important. So devise a sequence of small steps, and within these small steps, check in the code continuously along the way, passing the test. Be continuous, not episodic. You want these to be very small flow of operations. Aim for bite-size improvements. When you say, I want to refactor this, what else can I do? How small can I do? And keep coming down to it. Never refactor code that's not in a version control. Everybody's code here is in a version control, right? Yes, thank you. OK. Yes? <laughs> uh, don't hesitate to throw out change. I want to emphasize this. You need to have courage to say, you know what? What I put in is sucks. I'm going to throw it away and start over. I guarantee you, your code will be much better when you have, the, you know, fear, uh, have no fear to you know, throw it away. One more reason to check in code. When the code is checked in, I can go wild with my ideas. I'm not worried about losing my code. If I'm not checked in code, and somebody says, isn't this better? Oh, no, no, don't touch it. It's not checked in yet, right? So check in code frequently for that. So to wrap this up, here's a flow chart, right? How about that? Identify the code to refactor. That's the first step. All right, that's the code I want to refactor. What's the next step? Do you have tests? Uh, no. Write tests. Isolate code if needed. OK, we got tests. What do we do now? Perform a small 
yet a useful improvement. All right, done, what do I do? Ensure all the tests pass. Yes, they do, what do I do? Check in your code, rinse and repeat. Thank you.